Okay, so lately you might have noticed I've been talking a lot about island biogeography. I don't know why, it sort of just feels like I finally found something that I both really enjoy learning and nobody else on YouTube is really talking about. Or in other words, I might have found my niche. If you'll remember, this all started last year, after I made this video on why dodos actually went extinct, where we learned for the first time many basic principles like island gigantism and island dwarfism, and ever since I've been trying to expand our scope with each new video. But everything we've talked about so far has all taken place on, well, islands. Pieces of land entirely surrounded by vast oceans. But if you'll remember, at the end of this video I said, but okay, here's where things get really interesting, as this doesn't just apply to islands. So places like lakes, mountaintops, desert oases, caves, seamounts, and more all act essentially as islands detached from their respective mainlands. Despite the endless possibilities this statement set up, I haven't really expanded on this. But today I want to change that by taking us through a few examples of places that aren't exactly land surrounded by water, but nonetheless, due to their isolation, experience the same evolutionary pressures. Or in other words, here are three islands that aren't actually islands. To start us off, I wanted to look at maybe the easiest type of island analog to wrap our heads around. Lakes. In the same way that islands are small bits of land entirely surrounded by water, lakes are the inverse, small bodies of water entirely surrounded by land. By extension, this would mean the world's oceans serve as a lake's mainland or their source for species, the way continents are for islands. While there are absolutely tons of lakes all across the world for us to choose from, I decided we might as well look at one of the most impressive examples, Lake Baikal in Russia's Far East. Not only is this one of the biggest and deepest lakes in the world, containing more water than all of North America's Great Lakes combined, but the real reason I wanted to take a look at it is because it's also the oldest lake on Earth, and nearly 30 million years old. Meaning if there's any place that has had enough time for its animals to specially adapt to their lake environment, it would be here. While the area surrounding the lake, otherwise known as Baikalia, is home to a wide array of impressive animals, none of these can actually be considered part of the Baikal Island ecosystem, as their ranges all extend across the wider Eurasian arena, the same way how the fish that live around islands aren't subject to the same evolutionary pressures as the animals on the island itself. Instead, we need to look specifically at the animals relegated to living within the lake waters. Perhaps the most notable inhabitant here, and certainly the biggest, is the Baikal seal. Now I know what you're thinking, how on earth did an entirely aquatic animal manage to find its way here, almost 2,000 kilometers from the nearest ocean? And to be honest, we don't really know. Analysis of their anatomy reveals a close relationship to Caspian seals, but again, considering the Caspian Sea is nearly 4,000 kilometers away, or twice the distance as the actual ocean, this still doesn't explain how these seals could have gotten here. But it's also possible that their similarities have more to do with a shared common ancestor, the Arctic Ringed Seal. It's thought that back during the last ice age, when glaciers penetrated deep into the continent, they would have sustained enormous periglacial reservoirs, literally bringing the ocean to these lakes, potentially allowing migrant populations to disperse far deeper into Eurasia than is possible now. But to be honest, there is an even simpler explanation. Even today, Lake Baikal is in fact connected to the Arctic Ocean through the Angara and Yenisei rivers, offering a clear path for dispersal. While this might seem like the obvious answer, it's also worth noting that this would require the seals to switch from a saltwater environment to a freshwater one, something that can't just be done overnight, and considering the Baikal seal is the only entirely freshwater seal may in fact be a more substantial barrier than one might initially think. 
Overall, the existence of rivers, the differences in salinity, and the more temporary nature of lakes makes them not quite the perfect island analog. But nonetheless, at least here in Lake Baikal, we will find some examples of island syndrome. No matter how they got here, Baikal seals have been present for at least 2 million years, giving them just enough time to have begun adapting to the more limited food supply and restricted space of their lake habitat, leading them to grow smaller and smaller to the point where today they are far outsized even by their Arctic Ocean relatives, which themselves are one of the smallest seal species, nearly half the size of other Arctic pinnipeds like harp and bearded seals. Altogether, this reveals the Baikal seal to be a clear example of insular dwarfism. Of course, as we should all know by now, dwarfism is only one side of the island syndrome coin, with the other being insular gigantism. This tends to happen when small animals find their way from a resource-poor mainland to a resource-rich island, allowing them to grow much bigger than their mainland counterparts. In terrestrial environments, the limiting resource in question is almost always food, but this isn't necessarily true for aquatic environments, and here in Lake Baikal there's actually another important resource that can be found in abundance when compared to the ocean. Oxygen. You see, thanks to currents circulating around the world, ocean water has sort of been averaged out to a constant, where roughly the same amount of oxygen can be found no matter where you are. However, the process of water flowing through rivers causes it to interact much more with the air, oftentimes filling lakes with far higher concentrations of dissolved oxygen than your typical ocean water. What this means for animals like amphipods, small bottom-feeding crustaceans whose size often correlates more to oxygen levels than available food, is that the waters of Lake Baikal have allowed them to grow into giants compared to their oceanic ancestors. In fact, here the abundant oxygen and extreme isolation has produced over 350 endemic species of amphipods, many of which can attain sizes of up to 70 millimeters, compared to an average 10 millimeters most marine amphipods max out at. While they're both still quite small relative to us humans, this seven-fold increase in size is nonetheless the most drastic case of insular gigantism we've looked at so far on this channel, and together the tiny seals and huge amphipods of Lake Baikal make it evident that this environment puts evolutionary pressures on its inhabitants not felt across the greater oceanic arenas, supporting the case for this to be considered an island in the biogeographic sense at least. Moving on, our second example can be found within the southern African nation of Mozambique. Here, the hot tropical climate paired with only seasonal rains has produced a semi-arid environment of mixed grass and woodlands, or in other words, a savanna. But in 2005, a scientist by the name of Julian Bayliss was exploring the area using Google Earth when he noticed this patch of darker green atop Mount Mabu. Here, the mountain's elevation forces moisture out from the air, enough to sustain not only a forest but a full-fledged rainforest. You might even call this a rainforest in an unexpected place. While the area's local inhabitants have known about this forest for presumably thousands of years, it was only after Bayless recognized it on Google Earth that a concerted scientific effort was made to investigate and study this isolated ecosystem, leading to the discovery of several new species endemic to only this montane rainforest. Among these newly discovered animals was a pygmy chameleon, measuring only around 6 centimeters long, far smaller than the common African chameleon, which can grow up to 34 centimeters, serving as another potential example of insular dwarfism. But I'll be honest, this doesn't really make sense. I mean, like I said earlier, it's usually big animals like seals that shrink when in isolation, whereas small animals like chameleons typically grow bigger. Following this logic, these environments should have produced giant chameleons, not pygmy ones. Something about this didn't sit right with me, and I didn't want to just assume that their evolution into smaller forms was the result of island biogeography. 
But, well, since these forests only started to be studied in 2005, as of now we still lack a complete understanding of what influences evolution here. On top of this, there's very little available materials about these animals online, being, you know, newly discovered and all. I mean, just look at the Wikipedia page for them. It's literally shorter than the sentence I'm saying right now. But this example was just too perfect for me to give up on, so I decided to look a little bit deeper into these tiny chameleons, and specifically into their genus Rampholion. It turns out 19 species of Rampholion chameleons exist across Africa, and they all have at least two things in common. First, they all exhibit some degree of dwarfism, to the point where sometimes their entire genus is referred to simply as pygmy chameleons. And two, virtually all of them keep to isolated mountain environments. The Nguru chameleon is only found in the Nguru mountains. The Mahenge chameleon is only found in the Mahenge mountains. The Inago chameleon is only found on Mount Inago. The Gorongosa chameleon on Mount Gorongosa. The Udzungwa in the Udzungwa mountains. The Chiburon on Mount Chiburon. The Mulanhe on Mount Mulanhe. The Namuli on Mount Namuli. The Uluguru in the Uluguru mountains. And yes, the Mabu pygmy chameleon can only be found on Mount Mabu. Clearly, there's a pattern here. These pygmy chameleons appear to only succeed in Africa's isolated montane forests. Even still, this doesn't explain what causes them to grow smaller rather than larger, and at this point, I felt like I was out of options. Well, that is, unless I ask this Julian Bayless directly about this environment and see if he could shed any light on what sorts of evolutionary pressures animals might be experiencing here. Well, it's worth a shot. Okay, so change of plans. At the time of recording that, I had arranged an interview with Dr. Bayless, but then he got sick and I lost internet for a few days thanks to a snowstorm, and then he had to move back to Ethiopia for research, and it just didn't work out. Disappointing, trust me, I know. But in preparation for our interview, I read just about everything Dr. Bayless has written in regards to these sky islands. And I think I might have figured it out. What I failed to recognize at first is that these mountaintop forests represent an entirely different type of island than either Lake Baikal or true volcanic islands. You see, these both can be classified as de novo islands, or places that arose completely separate from any mainland environment, like an island forming in the middle of the ocean or the Baikal Basin filling as the Rift Valley opens, and so needed to be colonized by mainlanders, where they'd find previously untapped resources all to themselves. But these sky islands are what you could call fragmentary islands, as a huge forest used to cover the entirety of this region, allowing for some ancestral Rampholion chameleon to inhabit all of these mountains and plains simultaneously. But as the forest receded, leaving savanna in its wake, the woodlands that remained atop these mountains became isolated from one another, each one filled with the same mainland fauna. You can think of this like if sea levels rose, a once contiguous landmass all with the same biology would be split or fragmented into numerous islands. Except in this case it wasn't sea levels rising, but rather it was savanna levels that rose. From this point, each newly isolated population would need to adapt to their altered environment. And I believe this explains why these chameleons shrank instead of growing larger, as their environment and by extension their access to resources went from being extensive to being limited. The only way for them to persist in their new resource-limited habitats would be to grow smaller, even despite the fact that they were already quite small to begin with. Had these sky islands been completely uninhabited at first, like a de novo island, and then colonized by these chameleons, it's possible this would have led them to grow larger, as there would have been unfilled niches to take advantage of. But because all the niches were already filled when they became isolated, this offered the stranded chameleons no additional resources. 
This also explains how very tiny chameleons manage to distribute themselves all across the various mountains hundreds of miles apart from one another. My second question for Dr. Bayless would have been if there are any potential examples of insular gigantism atop these mountains, but to be honest I expected him to say no, so I also wrote a follow up asking him why he thinks this is. But now it seems obvious, no animal would grow bigger after having its access to resources limited. It simply doesn't make sense in this case. Altogether, I think this difference in island type explains the different evolutionary journeys taken by their inhabitants compared to what we, or at least I, expected, and again confirms that these mountaintop forests do behave like islands, only not the same types of islands as we're used to. Moving on, so far we've looked at environmental barriers like terrestrial to marine and elevational barriers like forests atop mountains, but to end let's take it back to the classics and look at a good old fashioned geographically isolated land. Typically this looks like an island surrounded by water, but water isn't the only thing that can isolate lands from one another, and if we look at the far southern extent of the Americas we'll find the secluded region known as Patagonia. Here the Andes Mountains serve as a significant barrier to animal dispersal, keeping this corner of the continent almost completely separate from the rest. But this is actually only one of two aspects that keeps this region isolated. You see, for most of this range's span, its elevation traps moisture from westward blowing winds on its eastern side, feeding the tremendous Amazon rainforest while keeping the lands to its west incredibly arid, creating one of the driest areas on the planet, the Atacama Desert. But looking further south, prevailing wind directions reverse, bringing moist ocean air onto the western side of the Andes, leaving it bone dry by the time it reaches the east. This has produced the Valdivian rainforest on one side and the Patagonian steppe opposite it, both of which are cut off from their northern mainlands by the other. Like this, Patagonia sort of acts like two islands rather than one, where animals on either side find themselves disconnected from any other of their kind. On the Valdivian side, this has produced animals like the Pudu and the Codcod. The Pudu is the shortest member of the deer family, driven smaller and smaller by the limited grazing area compared to the vast Amazon rainforest. Consequently, with smaller prey, any predators that eventually made their way here, like jaguars, could no longer support such large bodies, and were also forced to adapt, evolving into the Codcod, South America's smallest wild cat. Together, these animals appear like miniaturized versions of their Amazonian counterparts, and again undeniable products of insular dwarfism. Meanwhile, on the other side of the Andes, across the Patagonian steppe, we'll find similarly shrunken desert fauna like the peachy or dwarf armadillo and another tiny feline, Joffrey's cat, South America's second smallest wild cat. Though by this point in my research I started to pick up on a trend. While examples of insular dwarfism have been easy enough to come by, I've struggled to find the same number of examples for insular gigantism. Here in Patagonia, the only possible case of this would be the Mara, a rodent that's grown so big that it now just resembles a rabbit, but considering their larger relatives, the capybara, live not that far away and even share some overlapping territory, it's arguable whether these can even be considered giants compared to their recent ancestors. No matter how hard I searched, I couldn't find any answer as to why dwarfism would be more common than gigantism, so I had to do what people used to do before the internet, and I had to think about this myself. The first thought I had is that it's literally just easier. After all, growing smaller takes less energy, something all environments are capable of providing, whereas growing bigger requires more energy. Meaning that while the conditions for dwarfism exist throughout all ecosystems, those for gigantism require more rare circumstances like unfilled niches and relatively recent natural histories. Something that's far more common for actual islands than island analogs like those we've seen today. 
But to be honest, I wasn't really satisfied with that answer. And so after a little bit more thought, I realized there's another pattern that I failed to recognize at first. Something's been missing from all of these environments that's been present for every other island biogeography video I've made. Birds. Or actually, no, that's not true. All of these environments have had birds, but the difference here is that from a bird's perspective, none of these are actually isolated, as there's nothing preventing them from simply leaving and entering the surrounding mainland arenas, meaning they don't encounter the same types of evolutionary pressures as less mobile animals. This is important because virtually every other case of island gigantism I've talked about in other videos has focused on birds, and for good reason, as their need to fly forces them to remain naturally small and lightweight, and so when they arrive on islands where flying is no longer necessary for their survival, they usually have nowhere to grow but up. Add on top of this the fact that while true islands typically lack land predators, this isn't the case for any of the island analogs we've touched on today, meaning any birds that do take up residency in these places still need to maintain their ability to fly, and thus growing bigger and fatter just isn't a viable option if they want to survive. And together, I think these two reasons, the greater energy demand and the lack of endemic birds, makes insular gigantism a far more rare phenomenon among island analogs than true islands, and teaches us that isolation for one kind of animal isn't necessarily isolation for another. Ultimately, what this all means is that the geographic diversity of this planet, whether it's islands, lakes, mountains, peninsulas, and really every type of landform are each capable of creating their own unique types of isolation that can affect certain kinds of animals more than others, in turn producing an equally diverse cast of creatures all across the Earth. So whether you live on an island in the Pacific, in the middle of Siberia, along the African coast, or literally at the end of the world, thanks to island biogeography, you're sure to find something that can't be found anywhere else. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. You guys would tell me if I was talking a bit too much about island biogeography, right? Well, if you've been enjoying my continued foray into biogeography, let me know by giving this video a like. To be honest, I wanted to include even more examples of non-island islands in this video, but finding really solid cases was a little harder than I expected. So if you wanna see another video like this in the future, make sure to share some more places I should take a look at in the comments. Lastly, since you're still watching, I'm gonna assume you enjoyed this video. So if you haven't already, subscribe so you never miss a new one. And I'll see you guys soon with another one. Thanks. Oh, and I have a Patreon and check it out if you wanna support me and the channel. Thanks.